It's you liberals who have lifted them up, Howard. Paul, you conservatives make a mistake. You can't afford to strangle hope in people. Without hope, people become dangerous. No, Howard, you liberals have let them invade our society. You give them jobs, political jobs. Paul, you missed the point. It's only the smart ones we move up. <laughs> that makes it even worse. Oh, you know, we have to move them up. If we leave a smart one in the ghetto, he might develop into a leader against us. But if we raise him up into white society, we neutralize him. He feels compelled to try to act like us. He loses his identity and uh, his racial anger, if he has any. He becomes alien to his brothers. They realize he sold them out and they grow to hate him. He becomes worthless to them and safe for us. That's no thank you. In fact, in his love for the creature comforts, except for his color, he's become one of us. We, you're right, Sean. We are live, all the way live right here at WHBR. You're tuned in to Feedback, a positive image production by Hood Research. My name is Theo Broughton, co-founder of Hood Research, and my co-host. The BDN, we welcome you to the program. And it's a really comfortable day. Uh, humid, but nevertheless comfortable. Sorry. And... Uh, <laughs> We um, just want to take a moment to tell everybody hello. Um, this past Saturday, Hood Research had a fantastic uh, meeting, and um, we had the um, council president um, with us, and um, she talked about the uh, community benefits agreement. We had the ombudsman. He talked about the policy and process of uh, his department. And we had a Mr. Brinkley from Buildings and Safety. And we also had Tim Moore from UIN. And um, I just want to say good morning to uh, those of you out there that, that I um, uh, came across yesterday as we were out in the community. And uh, also uh, to uh, Brenda, um, you know, Barbara and Vera, Errol and Sam, uh, Tom and we were hoping that uh, Tom Barrow could be with us this morning, but um, he'll have to be at a later date. Uh, the beating. Yes, and I'd also like to just give shout outs to Ruth Ann, Jackie, both Jackies, that is, um, mm -hmm. Eric, also Smith Bay, um, Brother Fred, uh, definitely um, people who patronize hood research and we always ask you to have your friend family and neighbors tune in uh, for a lively discussion mm -hmm. and I want to say good morning to Vanessa and and also to Tawana and uh, Ron as well and for those of you who are interested in helping to sponsor this program please make your check or money order out to hood research if you prefer to make it out to WHPR that's fine we don't have any objection to that at all just make sure that you address it to Hood Research, P.O. Box, 4416, Detroit, Michigan, 48204. Again, that's Hood Research, P.O. Box, 4416, Detroit, Michigan, 48204. And we thank you for that. Hood Research has a uh, website, uh, which is uh, hoodresearch.org. We also um, have a thinker's report on the website, we have uh, Facebook, Twitter, and all the bells and whistles. So uh, at your leisure, take your time and uh, uh, visit uh, the Hood Research on website. And the uh, phone number is area code 248-234-2371. Again, that's area code 248-234-2371. We have with us as our guest this morning, as we always tell you, see the Feast of Famine. But um, we have uh, attorney Eric Williams uh, with us. He is a, also a professor at Wayne State University. Thank you for joining us this morning. Well, thank you very much for having me. You know, the BD has a broadcaster's voice, too. You just turn that up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that uh, you have done uh, a lot of um, research on the uh, citizens, um, uh, or I should say the community benefits agreement. And this coming Tuesday, the Election um, Commission 
is going to review the language of two of them. One that has been submitted by Brenda Jones, president of Detroit City Council, and one that has been presented by uh, Scott Benson, a member of council. And um, to our understanding, this has never been um, done before, where a council member presents a proposed, some proposed language, and another council member just, you know, bucks the system and comes up uh, with his own or somebody's own um, agreement that uh, does not appear to service the community in the same manner or to the degree that the first one. They will um, generally present one and have uh, discussions, debates, amendments over it, and that's that. But we find ourselves in a different position, and this coming Tuesday at 2 p.m. at the Election Commission on West Grand Boulevard, the um, language of the two will be heard by the commission. And for those who may not know, the Election Commission is made up of president of the city council, the city clerk, and the city attorney. So that's, that's what's going on so far. Have you um, come across any um, new information, different information? T tell us uh, where you are with this at this time. Well, I suppose the first thing people have to realize is that um, the first thing people have to realize is that, strictly speaking, I think that the community would actually be better off if uh, the Benson uh, proposed um, uh, ordinance, if that is the only one on the ballot, it would actually be better if it failed than if it succeeded. It actually doesn't provide any additional benefits to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, it encourages engagement, um, but I think the problem is that it would leave um, it, it would it would leave large develop large developments free to do what they do now, which is essentially come in, promise the world, and then deliver nothing, and leave um, the city and its citizens with very re very little uh, recourse when it comes to to enforcing that. So uh, it's mm -hmm. problematic. Uh, it's, it, I think uh, um, City Council President uh, Jones has actually been very forthcoming in describing how uh, Council Member Benson's uh, version uh, was brought to the public. The original uh, version was one that was developed by the community, uh, including Sugar Law Center and a number of other mm -hmm. uh, organizations. So mm -hmm. his, his, there's really no way you can look at it other than an attempt to prevent uh, any meaningful reform in this area. Uh, so. That's an excellent point because um, we we discussed this about approximately two hours on uh, Saturday, and um, the um, agreement that was presented by Scott Benson says that the community can only open their mouth if the proposed uh, deal for the city and, and their area was $75 million or more. And there are approximately 20-some proposals that are out there less than 75 million. That means that those contractors uh, <laughs> would go under the radar and you could not say anything. Just you black folks shut your mouth and sit down somewhere over in the corner. That that's, does seem kind of to be the uh, <laughs> That's the, the bottom line of, of uh, Scott Benson's proposal. And um, the one that uh, uh, is coming from uh, Brenda Jones uh, gives the community uh, an opportunity to uh, discuss them if they're 15 million or more. Uh, frankly, I don't think there needs to be any <laughs> any amount that uh, they can uh, skate under. And also, these people are asking for tax breaks, what you call tax abatements. Correct. 15 years, 20 years. I mean, hey. That means that all expense falls on the shoulders of the residents. Right, and, and that's the thing I w that people really need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, um, and so f we so frequently get caught up in the details, people are forgetting that the major issue is this. Mm -hmm. If you are going to use public money to essentially profit 
uh, a, for a private enterprise, mm -hmm. then there has to be a policy reason, right? There has to be a legitimate reason that the government has decided to give the people's money, the taxpayers' money, mm -hmm. to a private entity. Right. And there are a number of good reasons for doing that. You can do that because development in that area is important, because um, without these kind of uh, incentives, it would be difficult to get uh, some investment. But mm -hmm. at a certain point, you also have to go, well, considering corporations pay so little taxes in the state of Michigan anyway, mm. and that um, it's entirely possible that Detroit won't profit at all from these kind of developments, you, you have to, we have to ensure it. Now, in theory, we should be able to rely on our city council and our, uh, and our mayor to make mm -hmm. sure this doesn't happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, we can't rely on them. So the pro biggest problem with Scott Benson's uh, proposal, aside from the very high threshold that it sets, mm -hmm. is that it relies heavily on the people who aren't doing their job in the first place, necessitating a CBO, being in charge of actually under the CBO making sure Detroit okay. gets benefits. Now, if that was happening, if, the, if that were the case, if we could trust them to do that, then we wouldn't need a CBO to begin with. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, <laughs> when you uh, mentioned that, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is uh, the uh, hockey arena, the new hockey arena that, that is under construction because um, they're getting all the benefit and the community is, is uh, basically getting nothing. Even when you talk about the uh, construction workers, um, they seem to be from outside the city, and they don't appear to be people of color. So there you go. I'm curious just about a couple of things. This is still relatively new to me. One, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could give like an overview. What is the Community Benefits Ordinance or Agreement? Okay. What well, is the nature of it? Or Well, the purpose for the Community Benefits Agreement is to give an opportunity to the uh, taxpayers who are going to be putting this bill, an opportunity to say, hey, if you're coming into our neighborhood, we want you to have X number of people from our neighborhood working on the construction site, X number of people get jobs once, once the um, business has been built. Uh, we want to have some ancillary businesses around there or within your structure as in the, the uh, new arena they're going to have uh, plenty of uh, spaces for businesses inside and um, it would be um, uh, necessary for a business coming in who is asking not to pay taxes just to make money off of the residents that would be part of the customer base by the way to uh, give something back. Now, is it divided geographically like the city council and other areas? Is there certain areas that uh, are considered like, is the east side be one community or is the entire city of Detroit considered the community that's uh, going to benefit maybe from some future uh, business? Um, well, it depends on the area where the business is going to be constructed. We have a lot of excess land now that has had the structures demolished, and there are speculators who have been riding around, a lot of busloads as a matter of fact, uh, checking over the city and where they would like to put um, condos or department stores, et, et cetera. And um, the um, people who would be on the um, community benefits agreement board, if you will, would come from the census track. The first meeting will be call, called by the city council. And it would go from there that the members of the board would take control, okay, of monitoring what goes on through the city. Okay, so it's not zonal in terms of like 48205 or anything like this, so, but would east side people have any say so if uh, there was a development on the west side? trying to narrow it down because I don't know if it's inclusive or exclusive depending that's why I say you know well you well well part of they they actually vary uh, the Scott Benson's proposal I believe limits it to um, uh, the defines the community essentially as basically within sort of 250 radio feet uh, or so of, of the uh, boundaries of the project uh, the community one sort of uses the census track Right now, for example, there's a neighborhood advisory committee 
that was established in connection with the Red Wings Arena, right? And the uh, members of that na of that advisory committee, uh, and I'm actually vice chair of that, were pe selected from people who either live or work uh, near the impact zone. So basically it was taking people from uh, the, the Cass Corridor, Wayne State, Brush Park. Uh, these are the people who are near, who, who live or work in the immediate vicinity of the project itself. The idea is that if, if a project is happening in one area, you want uh, the people in that community to have some, some input. Uh, clearly a, a project happening downtown isn't going to really impact in the same way the folks that are, say, in, in Northwest or Southeast or, or, or Southwest, something like that. So it, it, is, it is fairly limited in that, in that respect. Mm -hmm. and who decides those limits? Is that what the board does? Is, because you use 250 feet as a, uh, you well, know. that's in the Scott Benson's proposal. Right, okay. So, so each, mm -hmm. each proposal takes a different way of kinding, of uh, deciding what well, counts as the relevant mm -hmm. community. Um, and the idea is that you, you want it to be inclusive. At the same time, you want to make sure that the people you bring in uh, have some expertise when it comes to uh, negotiating contracts. And it's going to really vary from community to community in, in some instances what's going to be most important is uh, environmental justice. And this is a big issue, for example, down in Southwest. Oh, yeah. uh, in other areas, what's going to be relevant is uh, historic preservation, or parking is going to be a, a, a real issue. And these are the type of things that you would like to see uh, the city council or the, you know, the administration negotiate whenever they gave these uh, tax, whenever they gave tax abatement or free land or, or other public resources to a private developer. Uh, but too often they're not being addressed. And the jobs are clearly one thing that needs to be addressed. But it's going to vary a lot from community to community. So what we need, that's why you have, that's why you have it so that each community gets to speak up mm -hmm. because what the priorities are will vary somewhat from community to community. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we want to uh, let everyone know that the uh, call-in numbers are there on the screen. Uh, I guess the follow-up that I have to that is like when you say census, because I know there's certain areas of the census, uh, well, city rather, that don't have a high concentration of people. It may be like eight houses on a block or something like that. And uh, whatever the guidelines are, you know, as you said, Benson said 250, but then there could be other uh, areas where you don't have a, a high concentration of people, so therefore they're not af affected as much, and maybe their say so or their input is limited by their numbers, you know. And I don't know if it goes any broader than that. You know, like I say, this is new to me, and I'm sure many of our callers, uh, our viewers anyway, are not familiar with it. That's why I'm trying to bring out certain mm -hmm. questions that they may consider as I'm considering. Uh, but when you get into an area that's not dense with population, and let's say, and you mentioned environmental, that's another thing that concerns me. So if somebody came in like, okay, we already know about the pet coke incident down there on the riverfront, uh, and those people were affected by that, I think they're more or less down river folks, but you know, or somewhere in the area of, uh, I believe it's the, um, Ambassador Bridge or somewhere in that area. Mm -hmm. So would the people have any say so as opposed to like, okay, they want to come in here, maybe they want to do something in terms of uh, processing raw materials and then look at the environmental impact. And then certainly if the city, you know, or whoever is on board trying to get them in, even with the abatements and that type of, type of thing, but the people who are affected, is there any, I, I guess what I'm saying, uh, when you, when you look at numbers that are not concentrated, how how does that play out? Because it seems to me that the people in the less dense areas, their voices will pretty much be uh, null and void. I, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not quite sure how you would deal with that, but you have to remember that if you're talking about a, a large development, right, uh, most of those are actually going to be more focused in areas where there actually is greater density. Uh, you don't have... Uh, if you're talking about a, a development that is taking place in a in one of the far too many areas of the city where there's literally nothing for blocks and blocks and blocks, even though there might not be residents there, there's certainly going to be, for example, organizations that operate in there. Whether you're talking about a nonprofit, for example, Focus Hope, or mm -hmm. or something else like that, so you're you're going to have uh, mm -hmm. an opportunity for community input. How mm -hmm. it how exactly it's going to be developed, I think, isn't dressed 100 percent in either version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is, no matter no matter how many people are directly impacted, 
the, it, you're using public money. And so the public should be receiving something. And it may be that if you're in an area where uh, there isn't a lot of population density, what's important isn't so much, isn't going to be so much, you know, in, in necessarily environmental impact. Jobs may become more important. Uh, you may not have an issue with historic preservation, but you're certainly going to want to see, for, for example, um, the entity to pick up the cost of providing security or, or cleanup that's going to be imposed on, on that area mm -hmm. and, and the city as a whole, uh, and they're not paying taxes. Right? right, and we'll be taking that burden on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, uh, for those of you who are tuned in, this coming Tuesday, which is tomorrow, at the Election Commission, located on West Grand Boulevard, diagonally across from the Fisher Building, there's going to be a meeting held by the Election Commission. The Election Commission, for those of you who may not know, is made up of three members. The President of the City Council, Brenda Jones, the City Clerk, Janice Winfrey, and the administration's lawyer, who is Butch Hollowell. This will be tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Now, um, that's what the uh, president of council announced uh, on Saturday. 2 p.m. tomorrow, Tuesday, at the election commission. Now, we talked to her about um, the community being able to address the election commissioners tomorrow. And it was mainly because there was a concern that she is for the Community Benefits Agreement, of course, that she introduced. And if it is true that the benefit agreement presented by Scott Benson came from the administration, now you have the corporate council that is going to be in opposition and uh, perhaps the, the clerk in opposition. Therefore, she said that if we show up in numbers, then she's going to make a motion that we have an opportunity to address the election commission prior to them taking the vote. Here we have a caller. As opposed to at the end. Yes. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Would you share your name? How are you viewing us? What city, please? Good morning. This is Dee Dee. Hey, Detroit. good morning, Dee Dee. You on my cell phone. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of quick questions. No, okay, at first, on the... Um, website Rise Together Detroit, there were three different um, CBAs, one from Benson, the uh, community, and uh, um, Councilwoman um, Brenda Jones's. So now there are going to be only two that are going to be, um, is, has Brenda Jones joined in with the communities? No, so I know she had, um, I had heard on another program that she said, you know, that she no longer had hers. That's one question. Mm. There, wait a minute, you said you saw three. One was Brenda Jones, one was Scott Benson. Where was the third one from? The community had, had, had collected over five, four or oh. 5,000 signatures. Oh, right. Well, my understanding Arrived from together this... together in Detroit. They had collected signatures, right. and that's the one they had. And then Brenda Jones said that hers, so now she's joined in with the community. Right. And hers is off the table then, right? From what she said on Saturday at our meeting, that's correct. Yeah, she withdrew. The only two. She withdrew her version of it to prevent... Uh, confusion. Mm -hmm. So, okay, my next question. I gotta, ooh. Okay, so there's going to be only in November. There's only going to be one version on the ballot. Well, they might kick the communities out tomorrow. That's what they're going to discuss tomorrow at the meeting at the election commission, whether or not both of them will be on there, or uh -huh. whether one. See what the election commission is determining tomorrow, from what she said, is the language legal or i should say legalese okay so so if it is um acceptable to the election commissioners then it will be on the ballot if both of them have a language that is acceptable then they can elect to put both of them on the ballot and if they put both of them on the ballot, they're well, going to put a lot of money behind Benson's, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if it's rejected, he might end up going to court, and all all kind of stuff could you know could take place. Okay, my yeah, next right. question is enforcement. Who would enforce? Okay, you get the CBA. Who mm -hmm. would? Inf I know Benson's 
it's got like the uh, corporate counsel, as your guest said, all the players that have not been doing their job are re- jobs already. <laughs> um, if right. the communities is um, put on the ballot and passes, who would do the enforcement it and the be, negotiations? Yeah, it, it would be up to the uh, community to enforce the host group. Uh, the the yes, uh, but then if you're talking about going to court. Not who would do it is not my question. My question is who's going to pay for it. That too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or would it come before the council and the council Mm-mm-mm. would take the ab- the tax abatements away? Mm-mm. Well, they they could do that, but uh, from uh, what we were told on Saturday, it would be up to the community to um, deal with enforcing it. If the construction companies or whoever the corporation is did not live up to the agreement and the other thing is i'm sure you have to make sure that your agreement contains that language too right right so the, and, and that's true one of the one of the things you have to look at is that under scott benson's proposal mm-hmm. there's essentially two tiers um and beginning you know one of them is 75 million and mm-hmm. tier can you one, talk into the mic a little bit i'm sorry I can't okay. hear him. so under scott benson's under scott benson's uh proposal Thank you. Um, of the two tiers that there are for the si- based on the size of the development, right? The only ones that actually have a legally binding agreement are essentially the very largest projects. And even then, it falls on the city to go and enforce them. And what they can do is basically they could take away tax abatements, they could impose fines, but they could also just issue a waiver and say, no, we're not going to do anything at all. For the smaller developments under Scott Benson's proposal, there's literally, there is no enforceable agreement. So if they don't really do anything, then, you know, sort of, you're kind of at a loss. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, for the the one that was put together by the community, what you have is a legally enforceable agreement. And the idea being that you can find that it's an agreement that could be enforced uh, by the community. Uh, What we refer to in... um, in, in legal terms as standing, who has a right to sue. It's also, because right now the way it works is there's no such thing as taxpayer standing. You can't sue saying, well, I have an interest in this because simply because I'm a taxpayer. There is mm-hmm. no such thing. So this would actually give the community a legal right to make sure that the promises that were made by the developer were uh, were carried out, and mm-hmm. that's one of the biggest uh, that's one of the biggest things that's lacking from Councilman Benson's uh, mm-hmm. proposal. Mm-hmm. So, if a CBA had been in place for the Red Rings Arena, we would have um, job training and apprenticeship programs and things of that nature, and jobs. Well, see, and this and is a negotiators. This is actually a perfect example because mm-hmm. the city did enter into an agreement with Olympia. When it, for the Red Wings Arena, and there are certain things that they are supposed to do. And in fact, creating the Neighborhood Advisory Committee was one of the things that they were required to do. Unfortunately, uh, the Neighborhood Advisory Committee isn't funded. Uh, we aren't paid. Uh, we don't have any resources to get the word out on what's going on. We rely entirely on social media. And they don't have to listen to us. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, there were some things that are actually put into this agreement. There's some other th- promises that they've made along the way, and n- none of those are, are really being uh, yeah, being kept. None of those promises are really being kept. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that you need to have, even though it did happen with the Red Wings arena, with the new arena, it's a perfect example of exactly why Scott Benson's proposal would be an absolute failure. It would mean nothing. It's exactly where we are now. And the truth is, if you want to know how successful we've been in holding Olympia to uh, their promises, simply drive past the site and look at the license plates on the trucks uh, for the workers that are out there. Talk to them. Take a look at, see who's, who's working there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then I'd like to look at the numbers, but they haven't turned those over, which is one of the things they were supposed to do under this agreement, which is exactly what would happen under Scott Benson's proposal. Mm. Thank you, Theo. Thank you, guys. Oh, you're Bye-bye. welcome. All right. Um, the um, question that I have is, have you um, uh, done any reading up on the citizen district councils? Do they still exist? Yeah, they do. However, they were defunded by Dennis Archer some years ago, 
and um, they there are a couple of them that do still meet. And they actually were put into effect by the state of Michigan, not the city of Detroit. But they're, um, they're having a difficult time. They're being ignored, even though they have a, a legal right. But there again, when you're talking about enforcing something and going to court, who's going to pay for it? So now in the city charter, we have another layer of, of BS, and that's the <laughs> citizen advisory uh, um, committees or something, uh, which simply means you can give the mayor your opinion if you want to, you know, spend the time. But the mayor's going to do what the mayor's going to do, regardless of what your opinion is. We have another caller. Sure. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Would you share your name, how you're viewing us, what city, please? Hey, uh, this is a So how you doing? We're you doing know, fine. Thanks for right. calling. Yes. Yeah. This is Attorney just, Eric Williams. Attorney Eric Williams. Yes. I just want to, you know, I'm listening to the, you know, this is put in the agreement so the citizens could sue or have a recourse if they don't, um, if the contractors or whatever don't mm -hmm. own up to their word. But how come it's just not in the language of the contract period? No contractor should submit any contract to Council without it already being embedded in their own paperwork. If it's embedded in their paperwork and it's signed, they have to put. Oh, Hello? it's, it's called Mr. Drive. Oh. Well, okay. you can call back. Uh, the numbers are there. And, you know, I guess I was thinking along the same way when you said if there's a certain minimum, then there's no. Uh, then they can just kind of skate by, but I yeah. believe our caller is back no, again. No input. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, go ahead. Okay, but what I mean is when you put the clause in there, because giving me recourse is one thing, but the challenges of that recourse is what we've been facing for decades. You want to get certain things done, it has to be in the beginning of the contract writing when you put it in. We it's in if if I want a contract with Theo, it's already in my contract, my contract that I'm going to hire X amount of Theo's workers. It's not going to come to you without you knowing off with my intentions of, of what I have for your company. Now this is contract law. This is how I got my distribution company because we deal with a lot of contracts and things get done to be when it's in the original language from the beginning. Now, I can get a judge to overturn or not even care about the provisions that was in there for Theo's uh, recourse because it never was in there from the foundation. I wanted to be there from day one. These contractors have to understand you have to put Detroiters first and show it in the wording of your contract when you approach our city council. And how dare our council give a contract to someone who doesn't honor the citizens here when they step up to approach. I don't buy that what Scott Vincent is doing. If you want to help us, Scott, then you make it a demand. If this ain't nothing, we got to come to court. Everybody can be good but these contractors. What's wrong with our city council letting them know we tired of y'all, y'all, y'all sucking, diving us. Y'all really don't do the job y'all say y'all do when y'all do get the money. Y'all have contempt for our city. This is something any city council members should consider when these contractors come asking for their money. That's and right. our money and our abatement. Okay, and if we can't get a council who got enough balls to do that, then come next year, we need to vote them out. Scott okay. needs to go. Brenda needs to go. They all need to go. All right. Now, let's let our guests... Uh, Attorney Eric Williams respond to some of that. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, he's absolutely right. I mean, one of the most important things is making sure that whatever we're talking about is in the agreement to begin with, mm -hmm. and that's another area where Scott Benson's proposal falls short because it doesn't really give the community a chance to be involved at the beginning. The problem, of course, is that inevitably whatever, whatever is in the contract, right, doesn't, you have to remember, this is a contract. This isn't a contract between the community and the contractor. This is this is or the developer. This is a contract between the city, which is a specific legal entity, right? And so, unless 
the city decides to go to court to vindicate its rights under the contract. Nobody else has a right to sue. I don't have a right to sue if, you know, your distribution mm-hmm. contract is wrong. I mean, I have nothing to do with it legally. Mm. And that's kind of what's been happening now. And you're very right. Right now, the city, our city council, sh- and our mayor should be negotiating what's in these contracts, um, making sure that they are for the benefit of the people, since they're using the people's money for a private purpose. And then when those promises aren't lived up to, the city should, in effect, make sure, you know, go to court if necessary. Right. These are all things they can do now. And this is exactly what Scott Benson's proposal looks like. It doesn't really change anything. Right. Okay. And what's happening now is in, is insufficient. It's clear people are upset about it. So I mean, he's exactly right. He's hit the he's hit the nail on the head in, in the sense that it has to be there at the beginning, and that's oh, yeah. one of the problems with Scott Benson's. And don't blame all of City Council. Um, uh, Brent, uh, Council President Brenda Jones, uh, Mary Sheffield, and Raquel Castan Lopez were voted against mm. uh, Scott Benson's proposal. So. Right. It's the other six. That's right. Now, it's, it's my understanding from the meeting on Saturday that uh, in, in the beginning uh, it is the key. Now, what 6-4 was, was saying is the contractor should uh, be um, respectable as, as he is and uh, look out for the community and its needs. However, it appears to me that developers are greedy, insensitive, and only interested in profit. So the Community Benefits Agreement would become an ordinance uh, upon approval, and in that case, there would be a negotiating team that would talk to the developer, and when the contract is written up, okay, that those agreements made between the two of them, as of whatever they were going to, you know, provide in the community or area where they they are developing would be they'd be held to that because they would sign the agreement with the community um, um, committee I guess we'll call it the committee so this tomorrow at two o'clock at the election commission the language for each one of those proposals is going to be heard by the election commission and if enough people show up Brenda Jones is going to make a motion that the community be allowed to speak prior to the decision generally the community has an opportunity to speak after the commission votes I mean fat chance I mean it's a waste of time you know to speak after the fact so anyway, that, that is what is uh, alleged to happen tomorrow. Okay, we have another caller. All righty. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Would you share your name? How are you viewing us? What city, please? You're on the air, caller. Hello? Yes, you're on the air. Oh, yes. My name is Valerie Glenn, and I'm calling in to ask um, the uh, Eric, Eric Williams a question regarding the elephant in the room, which is the um, at the what is it called? The advisory commission, the uh, financial review commission, which is the oversight committee that basically tells the city council, the mayor, as well as now the school board, what they can and cannot do. Are you familiar with that? And if so, could they not have stepped in after the original proposal, the people's proposal, was uh, decided, was passed, decided that it would go onto the ballot, and said, we don't want that, and we want this. Very similarly to what happened with Tom Barrow's voting initiative. Now, it's my understanding that their authority is limited to um, to city uh, actions that impact uh, revenue or expenses. I, I'm not familiar with how they'd be able to uh, intervene in, in this area. Bec- or, and actually, I'm not quite sure how they'd be able to intervene on, in, the Tom, in the case of the uh, voter initiative mm-hmm. simply because it doesn't impact, it's not a, it, there's no financial impact for it. It doesn't, it doesn't relate to how the city is spending money. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm not aware of how they might be able to step in 
But then again, remember this, even if they could, this entire thing benefits uh, a, a, CB, a CBO benefits the community. A lot of developers don't want them because they say it, it basically limits the amount of free money that they can give. And they're always going to say, <laughs> well, if you oppose additional burdens on us, we're not going to do development in, in your city. To which I would reply in many instances, okay, fine, we don't want you. Not all development is good development, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, I, and I'm sure people in, people in Southwest would certainly say, you know, yeah, we really don't want anything that makes our air worse, even if it means two or three more jobs, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. But the, the uh, Financial Oversight Committee is, is more aligned, is, is not aligned shall we say, with the interests of the people, more aligned with the interest of uh, our governor and our mayor, which means that even if they could step in, I, I wouldn't imagine that they would. Mm -hmm. I, you know, kind of following up on, she, she hung up, uh -huh. uh, following up on what 6-4 said, one of the things I'm concerned with, because you mentioned three council members who were opposed to the uh, Benson proposal, mm -hmm. uh, and you said that since the community has no real stake in it out i mean in, in terms of going to any type of legal action to make sure that they honor everything because if it's in the contract to begin with and they're not blindsided they already know what their obligation or responsibility to the community is and that the city council has to initiate something that will go to court what i'm wondering is uh who would spearhead that and, and how does that come about is there a council vote or something that's done that determines okay now we're going to go to court because uh, XYZ Corporation did not honor certain things that were, you know, initially agreed upon. Well, the the idea, of course, is that this would would be something that would be brought about um, by uh, Corporation Council, right? It would be their responsibility to, you know, the city had there's there's an outstanding obligation to the city, and it does and, and under the CBO, and it's just, it's the city it's Corporation Council's responsibility to make sure that uh, those obligations are met. So that's where the impetus will come from, Corporation Council. And if they don't, or if they just choose not to pursue it, let's say with the kind of vigor that's necessary to make sure it's honored, is there any recourse from the citizens who are in that affected area? Because that's, any, that, you know, that's yeah. uncomfortable for me as, as far as yeah. if they don't you know, pursue it with any kind of vigor. Uh, uh, what she said. What, what uh, Council Member uh, Brenda Jones said on Saturday is, it would be up to the citizens uh, to uh, file a lawsuit. <laughs> That's what she said. Okay. And again, my question is, who's going to pay for it? Well, so, sometimes <laughs> so, you might be surprised. There are there are a number of instances. So, for example, oh, take sure. the pet coke um, that was being done on the Hudson River. One of the people. There are a number of organizations that are always actively um, for these kind of issues mm -hmm. that will will be helping out. For example, Wayne State University Law School has an international. Um, environmental uh, clinic uh, mm -hmm. led by a guy named uh, Professor Nicholas Shrek, who's absolutely the person you would want leading a charge like that. And mm -hmm. so there are there are a number of instances. The Sugar Law Center itself would be somebody who you could probably uh, mm -hmm. to count on. But you're right. There's, it's, there's nothing built in that says, right. here's somebody who's going to do this for free. Right. And if the, and if the corporation is, is giving, a, uh, what do they call them, kickbacks? then the administration is not going to direct corporate counsel to do anything. Well, I, all I can say personally is I'm not happy with the city of Detroit or and such. I'm not happy with the, the idea that uh, they can come in, I guess this uh, proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing, show all this great intent and what we can do for your area, such and such, but have some sort of nefarious um, let's say ideas behind that because the whole initial thing if i want to marry theo i can you know just, hey look i got this great uh 10 carat ring for you i can propose so many different things to you mm -hmm. but when the time comes we're going to live in a nice five thousand square foot home but i don't have to honor that you know at some point and there's nothing she can do she's my wife now you got to you know you got to live in this hovel that we happen to have now and and that's what i feel about some of the corporate and, and certainly there's some that have good intent um, you know, I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, as Theo even said, and I agree, uh, the profit motive or the bottom line is the thing that drives most capitalist businesses, period. Mm -hmm. So they're not looking to uh, take any losses at all. And, and I just wonder if there's any type of, uh, and maybe it would have to be in the wording, some kind of uh, thing where 
it's indicated like if you don't hire so many minorities or if uh, we see that there's some sort of environmental impact, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, you are, again, uh, going to be held in contempt of the contract and we pursue it. But again, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that if the let's say if a majority of the city council says, well, no, we really don't want to press the corporation council to do such and such. Do they, does the corporation council act independently or do they act at the urging of city council? And then does there have to be a majority vote that, you know, follows through on that? Well, a corporation council to a large degree is, is makes the decisions themselves because they're the, the legal um, they're, they're the legal minds behind it, and if they say there's no lawsuit, then it wouldn't, wouldn't make sense to force them to pursue something where they go, look, there's no chance of recovery here. Um, the other thing I, I want to say is this. You have to remember that all the things you're talking about, in theory, can be done right now, right? There's nothing to stop city council and the, and the mayor's office from going after corp, uh, companies and developers that aren't living up to the promises they've mm -hmm. already made. There's nothing to stop them from doing mm -hmm. that. And when you say mm -hmm. that corporations, all they care about is profit, mm -hmm. to a degree that's right, but at the same time you have to remember this. Corporations, uh, large companies in general, have another thing that sort of keeps them in line, and that is simply how what they're doing impacts either their prospective customers or, or, or the public because it affects their image. So you won't have them, for example, large companies, putting really ugly or really dangerous things in suburban communities because those people get upset and they have resources. Exactly. But those same things are not in place when you're dealing with brown populations and poor populations. And that basically is describes Detroit, right? So okay. when it comes to Detroit, and you're talking about brown people and you're talking about poor people, corporations don't find themselves saying, well, we don't want to hurt these people. We, that, 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 that barrier you know, that restriction doesn't operate the same way, which is why you end up with dangerous um, things in poor neighborhoods. That's the, what the whole idea of environmental justice is about. That's why you'll see black communities raised, you know, t torn down in a way that you never see happen in the suburbs. And it's, and, and it's simply that, and I hate to say this, but poor people and brown people don't matter nearly as much. And mm -hmm. it appears that we don't even matter nearly as much to much of our city government. Well, yeah, I could agree with that. Now, let, let me back up a minute. Uh, Corporation Council is not e an elected position. They are part of the administration, so they're heavily influenced by the mayor. City Council has uh, RED, which stands for Research and Development. They have lawyers in that department, and they have them do uh, research on uh, various issues, but they will send their um, uh, proposed uh, ordinances, et cetera, to Corporation Council to do research as well as RAD. And the, um, it, what's sad is it, sometimes I think it might be better if we could elect our own Corporation Council. But uh, at th this time, we haven't gotten there. Hopefully, they'll open the uh, charter again in 2018 which was the original date for it to be opened in the first place. Uh, but um, the other thing is we need to elect our uh, state legislators, our state reps, and our senators. And sadly, the uh, economics and civics has been taken out of the school system. So that system where you will find many of our poor and uh, people of color. So they don't learn as much about government as was happening in decades uh, past. So they, they don't seem to connect the dots. Why should I vote? It won't make a difference. Well, if you don't vote, it definitely <laughs> will go against you. So you gotta find out about the candidates who are running for office and talk to people about it you know, when uh, years ago folks used to say, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. And as I, I came into adulthood, I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, every Saturday, okay, a Jehovah's Witness is ringing my doorbell. They're talking about religion, you know? So <laughs> they don't let it bother them. And um, 
If you don't talk about politics, you can't find out everything that uh, is, is important to know about. Because some stuff is not in the newspaper. Every stuff, uh, you know, all, all of the things are, are not in the electronic media as well. So we, we have to be aware of what's going on in our school system, which is destroying the on the second destruction of the uh, genera second generation, destroying our second generation. And um, we still need to, to uh, struggle against that. And we need to uh, find out about all the candidates because the good candidates uh, uh, seem to uh, not get the kind of attention that they need to get so that people can understand that they are working for the benefit of the community. Yeah, well, for obvious reasons, I certainly agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to actually clarify one point that we talked about earlier. I looked it up. Yeah. So enforcement, um, so there's an enfor under Scott Benson's proposal, there's an enforcement committee um, that, had, that includes uh, corporation counsel mm -hmm. um, and representatives from planning and development and the human rights department. Mm -hmm. And they will investigate um, any violations that are cited by the neighborhood advisory council. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, and it would be responsible, f and it would be the city council's responsibility to basically uh, enforce those. Under the community's proposal, um, they're, because they're required to enter into a legally uh, binding agreement with the community, failure to comply may result in denial, suspension, termination, and revocation or withdrawal of public support. Um, and this is the thing that developers should take heart in, is that it's not, they can't get what's what referred to as punitive damages, which means, you know, in addition to whatever was lost, uh, extra money, because you did something wrong, the damages are limited to simply enforcing whatever was in the agreement. So. Mm -hmm. um, those are the two different approaches uh, that are being that are under these two different proposals, because mm -hmm. the Scott Benson's proposal relies so much on an enforcement committee that's almost that's essentially the administration, the, the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it it's really it doesn't break, take us any further than where we are at this very moment right but, now. But what what makes it uh, bad again? is we're talking about $75 million and up. Again, exactly. The vast okay. majority of projects wouldn't and even And they will go right on under the radar and, and do whatever they want to do. Can we have another caller? Oh. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Would you share your name? How are you viewing us? What city, please? You're on the air. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh. Your Good name? morning. This is uh, Betty. Betty, thanks for uh -huh. calling. Uh, 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 Bill, I had a question I wanted to ask. I want to know, are there... <laughs> I want to know, are they still talking about having two separate public school systems? Oh, yes, unfortunately, yes, they are. Well, is there anything we can do to stop that? I mean, why is that necessary? We never had but one public school system. Why do we have to have two? Uh, well, they're setting it up similar to what General Motors did. And uh, one school system is to pay off a debt that our school district never created, which is a trick in itself. And the other school district is to uh, take care of the academics of the students. However, but, but, uh, Phil, with, hmm? what is it we can do to stop that? Is there any way we can stop that? I mean, that's well, not are, necessary. They, We've never had that before. That's they true. They are, they, to us. there are two lawsuits that are addressing it currently. And last Thursday, well, say two Thursdays ago, um, there were uh, two court cases on the same day, which seems intentional to me, that were dealing with it. One in Cincinnati about the emergency manager uh -huh. and the other here in the city of Detroit. And um, it was for the purpose of getting an injunction to stop the division. And interestingly enough, the judge who was doing a lot of filibustering, for as I'm concerned, finally said at the end, oh, this should not be before my court. And um, I talked to Attorney Sanders, and he was saying that um, the judge had uh, uh, allowed them to come into court that day, even though he knew it wasn't in his court, because the um, attorneys may have wanted to argue the issue and try to convince him to hear the case anyway. Now what? <laughs> well, they have to go to a different court. 
I forgot which court it is now. But, but they are preparing to go to a different court. And the other case in Cincinnati uh, is most likely going to go to the Supreme Court. Oh, God. I know. <laughs> They're, That's they're, what I was talking about this morning. They're buying I mean, a I lot hate of for it to go there because we don't have any help there. Well, they're buying time until the school system is totally destroyed. And uh, what was the golfer's name? Nicholas. Nicholas. Jack uh, Nicholas. Jack Nicholas is out in Oakland Hills today. And he has this um, uh, foundation and he's doing this fundraiser for guess who? Not Detroit Public School. But the Cornerstone school system, because they have about 3,000 students, and they want to get to 5,000 students. I can't imagine where those students will be coming from you know, I in hope Detroit. We can win this. I something we should be able to win. I mean, we have, we have good public schools. I went to public schools. I, I, I did do understand. Good. I understand, and uh, we, are, we are down to the last minutes of our show, unfortunately. But okay, uh, we will continue up. to call. Thank you so much for calling, Betty. We will continue to um, discuss the various issues. Uh, do you have uh, something you would like to say? I would just, mm. I would just sort of want to emphasize: people should turn up at the meeting uh, it's tomorrow. Absolutely. Tomorrow, it's mm -hmm. just two o'clock at mm -hmm. um, the election. The election. The, and do you have, haven't have have the address for people who can? Oh, I think it's 2978. But the election commission is on West Grand Boulevard, diagonally across from the Fisher Building. Right. I like to give landmarks. I know they can find the Fisher Building. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I say at the end of our show, it's not necessary for you to know everything. What is necessary is for you to know how to find what you need when you need it. And we at Hood Research seek out as much information as we can to help us all make better informed decisions. If you want to be nothing, do nothing. But the only problem with doing nothing is you never know when you're finished. Tomorrow, 2 o'clock, Detroit Election Commission. Be there. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you, Attorney Erica Williams, for being with us here this morning. Thank you. And we hope you'll come again. Just got to ask. <laughs> All right. Tune in again next week. Peace. We've got jobs that need skills in areas like health care. Jumpstart your health care career at Wayne County Community College District. We are moving towards the career technical education field in the areas of allied health, health sciences, outstanding health science programs in nursing, surgical technology, dental hygiene, and emergency medical technology. It's been an amazing program. It's a state-of-the-art facility with over 200 degrees and accredited certifications. Visit wccd.edu. Register today.